turn this around. We are going to have a different kind of picture now. So, um, I have to be the audience and what they think about their so yeah, I saw your hands. You were before. Yeah, yeah, I said, okay, um, this is it. This is my two hands. Oh, you have three hands. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm going to be sitting. So this is why I run this DNG. So I'm a huge, huge, huge fan of the Andy Cruz because they write the way I want to write and we have some in interest. He's interested in Lagos, I'm interested in Lagos. He's interested in ladies and sex, I'm interested in ladies and sex. <laughs> and he writes beautifully, you know. I, I follow um, Hali on Twitter. I haven't read any of her works, which I'm going to correct at the end of this festival or at the end of this panel. But um, I must say, you know, if you haven't gotten any of their books, you should do so now. He's a fantastic writer. He's not too, he doesn't kill us with drama, he just gives it to us. Like, let me drop the mic, I'm talking too much. <laughs> One of the early stories, um, and uh, the name and reason now. But so we have a, a and it's you guys have a coding problem. We have a, something we call a Nyao Bay problem, and um, in the story, uh, she there's these um, <coughs> boys who are Nyao Bay boys, and, and you can correct me because that's how I took it. But then they become these monsters. Uh, so I always love how, um, you know, with your work as well, TJ, um, I know it's not about you, uh, but I told you about your story, Jenna, and your collection, and which I don't know about short stories, because there's always that one story that is shy. Uh, but, um, so I always love how uh, writers of speculative fiction or sci-fi or whatever those genres are, um, how fantasy intersects with reality, right? And I love how the both of you do it in your work and uh, I will be getting a book so I'll comment and feel proud it. So, you know, I'm excited for this panel. When people say they want to read um, genre writing, is because they don't want in quotes something too serious, right? They don't want a light in quotes light read. But I found myself being very engrossed in um, when trouble sleeps. So was this a thought? Was this is this something that you noticed, or was it a deliberate sort of trying to change the narrative about um, genre writing? Yeah. So thanks, thanks for the question. Um, so you liked that, right? Yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah. So it was deliberate. <laughs> 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 right, because uh, you, even your speculative um, work, your, um, the, the book, it, it, it makes me wonder if these things are just crime fiction or say just speculative fiction, 
right? Because your character, the story that she, um, Sibongile, um, referenced, you have Koketsu. You give them this um, flesh and character that makes it very indigenous to us, our experiences here. I don't know, the work that you have read in um, be, growing up, or like speculative work, did you find, is, did you draw this sort of thing from them or you decided you wanted to have more fully rounded um, characters? Well, um, the speculative fiction I've read never included people like me. So when I started writing these stories, the one thing I wanted to do was to make sure that even if you couldn't believe that this young woman is a mermaid, you believe her story. You know, so you're like, okay, I don't believe in mermaids, but she's so compelling that you, you force yourself to believe, oh my gosh, she is a mermaid. And anyway, if your characters are not very strong or not very well thought out, then it's a bad story. Right, but this, in quote, bad stories seem to be selling elsewhere. <laughs> like, I don't know. I'm just saying, like, you, when, when you look at if these genres now, especially when in other parts of the world where they are practiced, it seems you don't do too much. Um, don't just, just tell us we want to see the glitz, the glamour of it. I don't know. Yeah, you see all of that. It's something happens in the future. That's just a background thing. Or, you know, this woman is growing somebody in a lab. That's just a background thing. It's a, it's a nice thing. You know what kind of world they live in. But for me, that stuff isn't more important than characters. Okay, thank you so much. Um, when I started reading your book, first of all, is, there, is this going to be made into a movie? I just have to ask that, to get that out of the way. Like, well, I would hope so. There were rumors, I don't know. Yeah, the rumors are, are true, and it's been sold. It's currently in development, but with this things, it, it might get done, it might not get done but hopefully it will get done. Because there is this cinematic quality in the writing. It feels like I was watching a movie from the very um, first page. The, it, ju it just pushed us into action. Yeah, that was also intentional. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> right, like, and then the structure of the chapters too. How you have, the chapters are very, very brief and I found it readable. Right, like I didn't get the books on time, so I, when I saw the size of this, okay, oh my goodness, how am I going to be done with this? But before I, I said, let me just go through, and before I knew it, I was halfway already. So how you, the pacing of the story, how do you manage the pacing? Because there are multiple subplots running at the same time, and there's this whole fear of um, losing the reader. So you have this very short chapter here, we are invested, and then you have the next scene, I don't know. I don't know if you can show us how, the, the um, writing structure or the editing, how the structure came to you for um, the novel. Yeah, so in a future book I'm going to write about writing, I talk about how I did this. If you buy it... <laughs> this man is the businessman. It's like... It's like... It's like I, think, I, think it's a, I think it's a reflection of my own attention span. Right. You know, and um, some people are amazing writers and they can write a 30, 40 page chapter. I, I'm not that, you know, able to stick with something you okay. know, for that long, so. And then I see chapters as scenes in a movie, you know, and most scenes was, would only last a few minutes. Yeah? Yeah, so then you move on to the next thing. And I think that's the reason it's structured that way. Okay, okay. And you have like, from the very first chapter, you're already throwing us inside, um, Lagos, and there's this sense of, okay, what is believable in this story? I want to tell myself that, okay, no, this is too much. But then again, I think, okay, but this is Lagos. Like, in the very first chapter, and I think this is the only spoiler I'm going to give you guys, but in the very first pages of the book, um, a politician and his um, private jet crashes into his house. Like, yes, I have, uh, that, that's the only thing I'm going to give. How? Yes, it's a spoiler. There are just, there are, there are, and there are tons of them. This is just the first um, chapter. Like, how? How do you navigate between what is, in quotes, real and um, or what is reality or what is practical? You know, when we are watching action films, for example, or if I, when it even comes to crime fiction, there is this element of the fantastical. Um, okay, this is action. This is too much. It can't be real. But he sort of tailored it to 
us here. Because whenever I want to say, oh my God, this is too much. These things happen at the same time. But then I'm like, okay, but then this is Lagos. Right? <laughs> so um, how do you navigate what is, between what is real and uh, what is um, factual? Well, I, I, think, I think that we are, in, you, people give writers too much credit. I think we are incapable of dreaming up worlds that cannot exist. I think in books like crime fiction novels or literary fiction, very often we can recognize these worlds. But at the same time, when we write sci-fi or magical realism, speculative fiction, call it what you can, it's my strong belief that they're possible. Maybe not in our reality, maybe not in our universe, maybe not in our dimension, but if you think about it, your thoughts, everything you are, is of the universe, your, your stardust, you and I. Mm -hmm. I don't think the universe can think of something that is beyond the universe. So I don't think it's a big deal. You just drink a lot of alcohol and write. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, in the, I think in the foreword for this book, yeah. <laughs> I had to, you know, are you expecting it? Let's be sincere. Yeah. No, but yeah, I mean, I, I really, I, I went along with what you said. You said, um, you, you, you say, there are stories that take place in the future, but we cannot, they cannot be called, strictly called Afrofuturism, because you are of the opinion that Afrofuturism is not for Africans living in Africa. Right. Yes, yes. Um, so, you know, Afrofuturism is the new buzzword. Everything is Afrofuturism. People standing in a scrapyard with grey paint on their faces dancing. Afrofuturism. Everything Afrofuturism. And I don't like to use words like that if I don't know what they mean. So I was like, let me find out where this word comes from. What's up? Because anything. Janelle Monet, Afrofuturism. Yonkin, don't So... <laughs> So I was like, okay, no, let, let, let me find out. And come to find out, it was in a book called Black to the Future, and a guy called Mark Derry came up with the term Afrofuturism. And it was definitely for people who feel divorced from their culture or their world. And so they imagine a future where black people are the majority and they use, you know, kind of technology in weird and wonderful ways. And so I thought, well, I live my culture every day. Um, I have no problem with speaking my language. I don't feel divorced from, you know, uh, my indigenous things. So Afrofuturism is not for me. And I also have a problem with it because why always future? Why not now? Why can we not be fantastical now? So yeah, no, I don't think Afrofuturism, according to me, I do not think that Afrofuturism is for Africans living in Africa, but I can understand why it would work for you know, people of African descent who don't live on the continent and are not a majority in their countries. It's a, it's a vehicle for them to express themselves. And I totally get it, but it's not what I'm doing and it's not for me. Not everything is for everybody except money. Yeah. Please clap. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, in talking about this, um, it shows that there's so um, importance that is um, put on categorization, right? Especially um, writers, not that a lot of writers are coming from out of Africa, um, especially within this genre, right? So, um, what of importance? Why do you think it's so important to um, do you think that categorization sort of shapes the reader's experience or? Our experience writing, uh, the, this whole, all these tags that they uh, categorization, I, I don't know if you have anything to say on that. Well, one, I'm just, you know, I, when I, like I said, if people are using a buzzword, I want to know what it is. And as soon as I heard that, I was like, oh, it doesn't apply to me, which is why when I read some of these books, I'm like, how? This seems like everyday downtown Joburg, you know, except maybe there aren't any spaceships. But I realize that that's because I'm living on the continent. But I mean, I still enjoy those stories. I just, I couldn't write one of those stories because my experience of my Africanness is different. Thank you. I was also going to ask you the categorization question too. I mean, um, you are not based here, but 
the uh, here in Nigeria, but it sort of plays a role to a certain degree on um, how books are seen or published. I don't know if that has been your experience because this is being marketed as um, crime fiction or an amaka thriller. So, um, in your let's say the response that you have gotten so far and how your book has moved in the publishing world, I I, I, I don't know. Have you found that that um, crime fiction limiting or is it much more than in quotes crime fiction? Well, no, I don't. I don't find crime fiction as a label limiting. Um, neither do I have a problem with um, uh, Africa noir or Lagos noir or or anything. Uh, there's some places, some bookshops, where they have black writing as a and as a category, nice. and that kind of sounds too close to uh, this is the African. Michael Jackson, or this is the African something. You don't need to qualify it. You're just, I'm just a writer. I remember I was on a panel once, and someone in the audience said to me, how does it feel like you know, to be uh, uh, an African crime writer in this age? And so I responded, and I said to them, have you ever had African cupcakes? And they hadn't, so I told them how to make it. You get all the ingredients for a normal cupcake, and then you get an African to bake it. Wait, you see, I love that, because African crime writer is like when people say, how does it feel to be a female writer? And then I say, do you really think that I'm typing this book with my breasts? <laughs> Just writer, finish. Did you know that um, the first, I forget her name now, and I don't think I should be checking on my phone, but the first published author, I think in Brazil, was an African woman. And people don't know this because she had to, someone said I do. Oh yeah, of course, Jennifer would know. <laughs> and she, um, she had to change her name. And some of the books, I mean, she wrote essays, she wrote novels, she wrote short stories. And in some of them, she'll change her name or she'll mess around with the name so they wouldn't know who he was. Yeah. But that's the first published writer from Brazil, a black woman. It, it has nothing to do with what we're talking about. I just thought it was interesting to share. So, yeah, it, it, it does give um, perspective. But I think at this point, um, I'll just um, give you a space to read an excerpt from your work for us. Yeah, thanks, but you've just given away what I was going to read. I mean... <laughs> I'm Sorry. still going to read it. All right, so I'm going to be reading the prologue, and this needs explanation. For the first book, my publisher said to me, you need to put a prologue, so I did, but I don't like prologues. So in the second book, I had to have a prologue again, and um, because I don't like prologues, the prologue ended the way it did. Have you ever been on a private jet? Chief Adil Douglas stretched his hand over Titi's shoulder in the back of the Mercedes S class. Titi shook her head. You will experience it today, he said. Titi called her feet up beneath her, careful not to scratch the black leather with the heels of her Manolo Blahnik sandals, and she folded her body into his arms. She looked up at his face. Is that the surprise? No, I've got an even bigger surprise for you. Where are we going? Should I have brought my passport? We are going to Abuja, to the villa. Titi unfurled herself. To Aso Rock? Yes, I am meeting Mr. with Mr. President himself. Wow, I will meet the president. Douglas laughed. <laughs> no, my dear, I will meet the president. You will wait for me in the presidential suite of Transcorp Hilton. Is that the surprise? No, baby. He pulled her back onto his chest and stroked her arm. It's a big surprise. Police officers at the gate stood aside and saluted as a limousine drove past them onto the execute jet secluded ramp close to the private wing of Murtala Mohammed Airport. Agents of the Department of State Services, who had been riding ahead in a Ford Explorer SUV, jogged alongside the Mercedes holding their Israeli TAR-21 assault rifles in both hands, butt stuck to the shoulder and muzzle tilted to the ground. 
The limousine stopped close to the upturned wingtip of an Umbrera Phenom 300. An agent scanned the shimmering tarmac littered with private jets before opening the chief's door. Douglas's white Agbada billowed in the kerosene-laden wind as he pulled it over his head. Titi, in a black tunic dress, walked around the armored car to join him. The boot of the Mercedes opened and DSS agents fetched Douglas's briefcase and Titi's weekend bag. Just behind the cockpit, the aircraft's door began to open downward. Through her sunglasses, Titi watched as the door stopped its descent a few inches from the ground. She looked at Douglas. Can I take a picture? He smiled. Sure, so long as I am not in it. She turned her back to the aircraft, helped, uh, held up her phone high in front of her and pouted. On the screen, she saw the pilot climbing down the steps. Didn't you say your ex-boyfriend is a pilot, Douglas said. Titi's hands dropped to her side as she turned to look back at the pilot. The young man was standing by the steps with his hands held behind his back, his eyes hidden behind his aviators, and his head slightly tipped upwards. He stood still like a soldier. Douglas placed his hand on Titi's back. Let's go, he said. Her body resisted his push. Is anything the matter, he asked. Titi turned away from the pilot and looked up at Douglas. Is anything wrong, he asked again. She slowly shook her head. Okay, then let us go. I don't want to keep the president waiting. Douglas and Titi waited for a DSS agent who had carried their luggage onto the plane to descend the steps. Then, with his hand on her back, he ushered her in front. The pilot remained still. Wait, Douglas said. Titi stopped her hand on the cold handrail. Titi, meet our pilot for today. Captain Olusegun Majekodumi. Did I get that right? The pilot nodded. Olusegun, meet my girlfriend, Titi. Titi did not look at the pilot. The pilot nodded, but did not look at Titi. They sat in the middle of the narrow cabin in beige leather seats facing each other. Neither spoke during the, ju during the jet's takeoff and short climb. Titi kept her sunglasses on, staring through the window. Are you okay? Douglas asked when the jet had leveled out. Did you know, Titi said. A tear appeared below, below her sunglasses before dropping onto her hand. He unclasped his seatbelt and leaned forward. You knew, she said, removing her sunglasses and place, placing them on her lap. The lenses were wet. In a couple of months, I will be the governor of Lagos State. You will come and live with me in the state house. You're married. More tears ran down her face. Yes, and so what? He's my fiancé. Ah, and who am I to you? A sugar daddy? You're married, chief. You're married. You lied to me, Titi. You lied to me. But I forgive you. Titi buried her face in her palms. Douglas held her hand, but she slipped out of his grip. Why, she said, looking up at him, mascara leaking into the powder beneath her eyes. I will be governor. He is just a pilot, a glorified driver. I want you to choose now. Do you want to come with me or do you want to remain where you are? She shook her head and turned to the window, closing her eyes to the brilliant sunshine, searching for the window blind. He stood, leaned over her and reached for the blind. Looking out the window, his face creased. That's strange, he said. She looked out the window to see what he'd seen. Then she looked at him. At that moment, the engines roared, her sunglasses floated off her lap, as, and she lifted in her seat, a body held down only by the seatbelt around her waist. Douglas, who had been on his feet, lost his balance, cracked his head against the sidewall, and fell to the ground. Titi became dizzy. Magazines, cups, and a silver tray darted about the cabin as the jet flew nose down and she began to black out. Uh, I'm going to read from a story called Ghost Train Inn. My favorite story. Yeah, it's the one that Spongile mentioned earlier. Koketso may have been the first to notice, and it hurt him physically. His stomach ached for days when the size and the shape of the problem became evident. How could the neighborhood not realize what was happening? If people who lived close enough to smell each other's dinners couldn't see it, 
What about those who didn't know the names of their neighbors? Being a young person whose observations and opinions are not very valued, Kogetsu knew everybody would believe Kogetsu knew nobody would believe him. By the time official announcements had been made, hearts had been eaten, and whole neighborhoods ev evacuated. You see, a major event is really just a string of small, overlooked events holding hands. One of the little hands was when Kogetsu stopped using adjectives. How could he possibly describe anything when the world around him had lost its color? Stephen was the color ever since they were kids. Kogetsu drew the lines and saw the bigger picture, but Stephen always added the color and purpose. Girls were the bright saffron of their afternoons, but also the gray of their rejection. Weekends with Stephen were purple, either royal or messy mulberry stain. They both added something to each other's lives. Before he met Kogetsu, Stephen was just floating and rarely feeling. As soon as they became friends, he started to like the warmth of the feelings he sometimes caught. Aimless Saturday afternoons became an opportunity for Kogetsu to listen to Stephen talking to people who passed by his uncle's house. Um, Tepan, you're still wearing those fake shoes. You're letting the neighborhood down, Wen. This is why the boys in this neighborhood don't have girlfriends. <laughs> Many people commented that they had never seen Kogetsu love before Stephen came into his life. Because they attended different schools, Kogetsu found his hours in school remained anemic, and Stephen found he was followed by a relentless emptiness to every class. Every few months, Stephen found a new hobby for them to take up. The one that Kogetsu could never get into was graffiti. The smell of the spray made him dizzy, and he didn't, like that he, he didn't think he had a creative bone in his body. He just watched Stephen paint everything from the walls of abandoned buildings to port -a and sometimes cars. The, sources of the, spray, the source of the spray also made Kogetsu nervous. Stephen mumbled something about a friend who knew about his passion. Train surfing was by far the most exciting and stupidly dangerous hobby that Stephen introduced. Once a week, they would take a train instead of a taxi home from school. Once inside, they would slide out the windows onto the top of the train. Kogetsu only took part because he had worked out that the likelihood of them being electrocuted was low given the slow speed of the train on their way home. Still, it was thrilling for Kogetsu to watch his friend dance on top of the moving train. It made him feel alive. Isn't that what we're alive for? To feel alive? Was what he thought when his mother threatened to kill him herself rather than to collect his charred corpse because he was train surfing. Um, thank you so much for your readings. Um, <laughs> I, I still have to ask this categorization question. Um, there's a part uh, where I got to in the book, your book, When Trouble Sleeps, where I said, no, I'm sorry, this is not crime fiction for me anymore. Is this scene where um, Amaka goes to um, Bukobiri, um Yeah, you know, usually when you're reading the material or watching a movie, there's this, um, way that you can, you are, there's this comfort you get from knowing, okay, it's just a book. Yeah, you can separate yourself from it. But in, I'm seeing the streets, and yeah, isn't re everything is real. And then, uh, which suspense reality for me, right? Then um, in that scene, Amara goes to Bogobiri Hotel, and then she sits down on the bed, and then she looks at a painting by Ndidi Emelifele, uh, uh, whose work is, is very popular. Ndidi is a very popular visual artist and um, of a woman also sitting down. So there's this um, frame within frame juju that you did there, <laughs> right? And I am not going to ask you if you were writing that this When Trouble Sleeps with the consciousness of um, a literary, as a literary work or crime fiction work, but what I will ask is, um, okay, at what point, like how do you draw the boundaries? Like at what point do you think this is leaning more towards crime? or more towards um, just a general genre book? Well, um, that indeed, the, uh, that um, MFL yeah. painting, yeah. I Is own it. it. I own it. Right. It wasn't in Bogopiri, it's in my house. Um, I don't think you need to draw a line. I think it's a bit controversial, and simply because I'm lucky to be on the stage here, I, didn't, I don't think it gives me a right to an opinion on it. Uh, so if I share my opinion, it's not because this is the truth. It's just what works for me. And I believe that what we used to, what we term 
literary fiction today, the classics, were popular fiction of the day. Now, unfortunately, some people think that very wordy writing is literary fiction. Ouch. But that only happened. That, that, that tradition, I think, I may be wrong, happened when people were being paid by the word. So they had to put as many words as possible to describe a young girl standing up and going to the window. You, you, get, so you get more money. If, yeah. if you're being paid per word, you know, you want to have a whole essence to show, you, you, you want to put as much into that as you can. It's not just about walking from the bed to the window. It's about the journey all our female ancestors took from their place of resting to their place of whatever, right? Because you have been paid by the word. But then look at someone like Jim, um, Elroy. Okay. I mean, you read Elroy sometimes and you're like, whoa, why is this very choppy? Because once upon a time, somebody said to him about one of his manuscripts, it was too wordy, he had to cut it down. And he went through and he selected all the adjectives and deleted them. And the books are still amazing. They're classics. Yeah. I believe that in the future, the classics, the so-called literary fiction of many years in the future, would be the genre fiction of today. It'll be my book. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's better for all of us, right? Yeah, and um, I, you know, in your work, I, I found it very humanizing. Um, what the themes you express, especially as uh, for black bodies now, um, the more uglier aspects of us. I mean, of course, somebody was growing tentacles and all that, but I, I, I found it very humanizing because even existing in spaces, and I know as a Nigerian, I cannot um, relate much to this, but. Um, for my friends who are in South Africa, for example, there are certain aspects of themselves they have to hold back for a certain, um, to appear a certain way in the world among um, the colors and the whites and everything. But this book had this sense of um, release because this black body is just, this person is just free. Um, your character, in the first story, the character goes home and tells her mom, oh, this has happened. And the mom is like, ah, don't worry, we are going to fix this. <laughs> And I tried to picture it in real life, and I could imagine, ah, in Nigeria, ah, you are in trouble, oh, what are we going to do now? Ah, you have finished me, right? So I, I found it, um, this liberation that you brought to um, black bodies in, in the speculative room. I mean, the fact that it had to be in a speculative room, I don't know. <laughs> so when I wrote most of these stories, I was very angry with South Africa. Um, I, you know, sometimes we feel like our, all our countries do is break our hearts. And I couldn't write something, I just, I wasn't able to write the things I wanted to say using what I had used to write The Yearning. And so, um, the first story I'd written a long time ago, and I felt as though, yeah, maybe I should write all of them like this, you know, because I do feel like South Africa dehumanizes us a lot. And so I wanted to look at, uh, you know, like uh, Ghost Strain Inn is about these kids who are addicted to Nyaupe and how the community reacts to them. You know, they, some people are joke about it. They're like, ah, Nyaupe boys, you know, oh, they're stealing the taps or whatever. But for me, it was like, well, what the hell did we do as a community for these kids to feel like they needed to numb the pain? And so I wanted to focus on those kids and the relationships that they have with their friends and their peers and see how can one person go one way and another, you know, become a Nyaupe boy. And also I wanted to focus on the relationships that young black men have with each other, their friendships. Yeah. You know, because they can be quite tender until they start bonding over violence. <laughs> Wonderful. Because, and you have, um, what do you call it now? In, I think in that same story, it, it became this, so you're looking at the society that they were being raised on. And there's this part where you say, um, I think on page 40, um, it, it, it reads, you say, there, was no, there were no more jobs to wake up for, nor was there any civility or respect for the property of others. There was no longer a threat of hell or suffering of the afterlife. If they didn't love their neighbors, hell was visiting earth. The hell visiting earth had stripped away the good nature they had always assumed was inherent. And as a Nigerian, I felt attacked 
<laughs> no, because um, I, I think just some months back when we had the whole xenophobia crisis, when it came to a sort of head, and um, in Lagos here, um, um, some Nigerians wanted to take matters in their own hands and they moved into their destroying certain properties and then they moved into shop right. Some people were um, okay with a measure of it, like, okay, they are just going to go and destroy um, properties. Then at some point, they left ShopRite and started vandalizing everywhere. And then in traffic, um, the cars that were in traffic were also being um, vandalized. And people were robbed for people who were living along Lekki, along that um, axis, were actually attacked by the same Nigerians, right? So the, it, there was this whole suspension of... Um, what the law and order, like it just, we just, it just, it just became like we were all mad, like we had been hit by this viral strain. Because I imagine that before they got the news, I'm sure the Nigerians who were just going along that area, they were not prepared to do violence. But once they just got it, like once they just saw on Twitter and everything, it something just activated in all of us. And I don't know, it made me, I, really, I was really worried. There, there, there seems to be this... Um, idea that a dystopia is one future that is going to come. But constantly, I am reminded that we are in, <laughs> we are in a dystopia. I'm, I'm reading your book, and I want to consider it as fantastical, but you said everything. <laughs> I'm very, very sure. I won't, I won't be surprised if lot, a lot of it is already happening, right? And so it's somehow your works still um, drive us home to reality. In both books, um, I don't know if you want to comment on that. Well, it's that thing that I said about Afrofuturism is always about the future, right? Whereas I'm interested in us being fantastical zombies and mermaids right now. And you know what? That stuff is, that stuff is believable. Because when you... I, I, maybe I need to describe what somebody who's on Nyaupe looks like. Um, quite often, and I remember seeing this in my dad's car, it's like being suspended in a moment of ecstasy or oblivion. Like the muscles lock up and you're just like suspended in a moment. And people are going on about their lives. And I was like, you know, if this was a zombie outbreak, we would all die because nobody is like, what is happening to those people? And you see one Nyaupe boy and then next week there's five of them hanging out in that place, just suspended in this it's so painful. So for me, it was like, I don't know if zombies are so far off, actually. But I'm interested in Afro now. Afro-fantastical things. Now, I don't know. <laughs> that, was, that was wonderful. And we only have 20 minutes. But um, in both your books, um, human bodies, black bodies, are subjected to a larger chaos. It's always the outside that is imposing itself on the individual. Right, it's like you have in, in your book, you had different systems, you had the whole, um, I don't even know which word to call it because it's not even sex work anymore at the point. You have these girls who are recruited and the way they are recruited, you start from their perspective. So we know that lots of them, they didn't even go into it, will I say, willingly or consciously, right? So, but somehow, like even from the, this is the second um, book in the series and I want to ask, what, um, how much power do we have over uh, individual, as, as an individual, how much power do you think we have versus the system? Because Amaka keeps on beating it every time. I was sure halfway that she was going to die. I was very sure, okay, that's another that spoiler, she doesn't die. But I mean, <laughs> no, it's, it's, an, it's, it's, an Amaka, it's an Amaka thriller, thriller, so obviously there's going to be another, another book in the series. And obviously she didn't die, I mean, it's an Amaka thriller. Okay, he will beat me up outside, so. But yeah, but how, how, how much um, power do you, do you think it's, in, it's that in real life we can have that much influence over our destinies or over our lives? Yeah, I think you can permit yourself to be whatever or feel whatever you want to. I think ultimately everything about you, your reality, your happiness, your sadness is, is up to you. I don't know, what do you think? Well, I think, yeah, I mean, obviously there are these structures Right, but I think most importantly, and I think this is why I wrote stories about these individuals who are really unremarkable people just stuck in a bad country that have extraordinary things happen to them. And for me, it was always, what choice do you make? Yeah. 
you know, because yes, of course, apartheid happened. Yes, of course, you know, sexism, homophobia, Afrophobia. But in those small moments where you have to make a choice, that's what I was interested in when it came to the characters. And they did make some bad choices and some good choices, but they became control. They became in control of their narrative, whereas before these things happened to them, the world was just happening yeah. to them. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, I've been enjoying this so much, and they have warned me that I, have, I don't have much time left, so I'll just um, throw the questions to the audience. So, questions? Okay, right. Um, well, later, Labi, who is the person with the mic? Okay, yeah. Hi, my name is Wale Talabi. Uh, I have a comment that halfway through is going to morph into a question. So bear with me. Where is um, Kina when you need her? <laughs> Don't make me run, I will run. Okay, my comment is, uh, TJ, you talked a lot about how sometimes people say in genre fiction you don't have well-developed characters and so on. It's not true. Okay. Uh, it's, it's never been true. The genre is more of a marketing term. I don't think writers have ever cared about it. You develop your characters as you like, depending on the objective of the story. Sometimes you want to, come, you want to focus on the idea. Sometimes mm -hmm. you want to focus on the character. Sometimes you want to focus on the sense of wonder. It depends on what you're trying to do with the story. Okay. So in that sense, what I wanted to do is, because as writers, I'm sure we all know, this is, we play with genre, we cross genre all the time, we do whatever we want. You can put literary elements in the science fiction or crime novel. Um, I wanted to ask, what are your favorite writers, or who are your favorite writers in the, in the genre that you currently write in? So for example, like, um, crime fiction, who's your own favorite crime fiction author? And uh, Mohale, who's your favorite speculative fiction author? You, so get, you get bonus points if you say it's me. But, can I you know. refuse to answer this <laughs> question? So see, I, ref I, I refuse to ask that this question. This is a terrible I, question, I, 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 refuse, I refuse to ask those questions, right? So the audience, I try my best, so yeah. Yeah, no, I'm not answering this question. Yeah, no. It's not happening. Which, which, which speculative writers have shaped your career? <laughs> Tell us. My mother. My mother has shaped the writer that I am. Can somebody please tweet this so I can screen grab it and send it to my mom? <laughs> yeah. Your turn. Answer his question. Well, it's it's like it's like those um, articles in uh, literary columns of newspapers. If you must read one book this year, read this. What do you mean if you must read one book? You know. So I don't think there's such a thing as a favorite author. You know. Sorry. Eddie. <laughs> okay. Um, please wait the mic, person. Okay. Someone from here. Who's the mic? Okay. Okay. Um, okay, just please be fast, just okay, one question. Um, this is for Leia. What was it like, write, like, what inspired you or made you decide to write as your main character being a female, you being a man, and what was that experience like for you? And then the second question is also, so as you have been, as you have written this book and you have mentioned this many times, TJ, what has it been like for you to see the new cycle of everything in Nigeria this year and be like, well, this is very similar to everything that I've like what has that feeling been like for you? Okay, so what inspired me to have a female lead character? As a man. man. Oh, how me being dare a man. You? Oh yeah. Well, I am. And how was the experience of being a woman? I'm extremely. <laughs> I'm extremely in touch with my feminine side. I, I, <laughs> and when people would ask me normally that you know everywhere they would say to me for a man you write such strong female characters it used to bother me because I don't know what this strong female character is which would mean there's such a thing as a weak female character and I'll, I'll tell people what I've always said what I always used to say Amaka is a composite character of the women I know and not one of them is this weak human being that some people think should exist so Amaka takes her name from a person a friend takes uh, the way she looks from somebody else uh, takes some of her backstory from someone else. So she's just this woman, amazing people I know. And if you want a central character, you want an amazing central character. So that was easy. And for a long time, this is what I said, until someone said to me after uh, a panel, she walked up to me and said, where's your mother in the book? 
And then I realized at what, that what, point, what, what, where's what? your mother in the book? It's what you call a powerful question. <laughs> and at that instant, I realized, oh, it's Amaka. Uh, Amaka is this amazingly intelligent, beautiful woman, my mom, who decided to dedicate her life to young women, my mom, who does things her way to sort out things, issues, education, health for young women, my mom. And that's the reason when I realized this, in the first book, there's a lot of sex and Amaka has a lot of the sex. But when I figured out that Ooh. Amaka is my mom, <laughs> No more sex for her. <laughs> okay, my name is Temitaya Olofinola. My question is for Leye. Um, writing on that, writing on the qu other question, it's about women, female characters in Lagos. Many books that deal with Lagos, the female characters are usually come to the city and get destroyed, technically. So you did a they come to the city and the city destroys them, the city consumes them. So what you did with Amaka, I found it really um, remarkable. But the other question is about um, reality and fiction and how um, in your book, much more than saying that um, fiction borrows from reality, I also got this feeling that reality can also learn from fiction especially considering the behind the scenes of how the women report the how they check up on themselves and yes, account yes, for themselves I found that very so real. With yes. the network they start yes so i was like I mean, um, yeah, perhaps there is so much that reality can actually learn from fiction you know after your book there was a police raid on women and and all that so i'm wondering how did you weave all of this into the plot Um, yeah, if it worked for you, I, I planned it. <laughs> Any more questions? Well, okay, because I have, okay. Okay, hello. Um, my question is going to be about um, your style of writing. I'm talking to the both of you right now. Uh, there's something I discovered about your writing, Lay, the, the description, the style. It's a short, the diction is short, it's simple, but there is almost like every word has an adjective back in it. I don't know if someone else observes something like that. So how do you do that? And how do you know that this is just the right amount of adjectives or this is just the right amount of description I have to add to this character to make it more vivid? I'll be very quick with the answer because I want to hear from someone who writes more seriously than I do. So the reason my sentences, uh, my prose is very lean uh, is because I have a very limited vocabulary. So I can only use the words I have. And also, I have amazing editors. I was going to say, amazing editor. I mean, when you're writing, obviously, you're going with your gut and you're just like, you're just purging the story. And then when it gets to your editor, your editor's like, mm, okay. That's nice, but we want a novel here, so <laughs> let's take out the bits that are maybe don't belong in this, save them for something else. So really, it's just having an amazing editor and an editor who understands you and trusts your vision and you trust your editor's ways. Last question, going, okay, CJ at the back, just one more question before we go. Hi, um, I've heard some, sorry, okay. I've heard some writers, someone like um, Thomas Mann, for instance, he said once that he would rather participate in life than write a hundred stories. I guess I just want to know um, what your perspective on that is. Would you rather live or write? If it I mean, came right down to it. Um, the writing is part of my living. So I'm doing both all the time, constantly. In fact, right now, I'm writing a story in my mind about that question. <laughs> Do you want to answer that? I couldn't possibly add anything to that. 
I mean, like serious, like there have been so many book panels in this festival. Why did you choose us to attack? Like, what was the point? In fact, this one. Thank you guys for coming. Bye bye.